Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to the canyon, and welcome back to a second of firsts. This is the second part of the quick view of, of the Red Cat Ascent. There it is right there. What did I do? I filmed the first installment of that part one of the quick view. We have never done a multi-part quick view before because it kind of flies in the face of things like quick views, but there was a lot here to unpack, okay? It isn't explicitly anything Red Cat has made before, so there's a lot to look at. And the problem is, and here's where the problem arises, the, the longer you look at it, the, the, the stranger it gets, let's say. So I, my first instinct was, what my first instinct always is. We finish it, bring it inside, start tearing it apart. And then my ability, my inability to retain things in both the short and long term uh, told me that I would f immediately forget. So what I did instead was I brought it in just as it sat in its configuration, in its RTR configuration out of the box. And what I did is I took it in here and I put it on the scales. So we, we scaled it up on the scales with, uh, I have these removed because these, these shall never be reinstalled on the scales with the body, I'll put this guy right here with the body installed, uh, 1500 S pack in place. The vehicle weighs 2,608 grams. That is 5.75 pounds in RTR configuration. And I just have to assume that some of that weight is uh, brought to us by uh, flat plate stainless rails. Just has to be. Uh, I was in, I, I didn't anticipate a weight that high. Like with the wheels and tires removed, it is still quite dense. And I think that's a big part of the problem. The wheel tire combo, as we see here, the nameless, just direction, uh, direction of rotation mounted, noted. And we have seen this particular tire uh, I mean, this particular wheel, so, so, so many times. Uh, those four wheels, tires, and foams weigh 480 grams, which means that the their portion of the unsprung weight of the vehicle is 18%. That's not great. Like, you usually want to be at least 33%. So that's not helping. So I weighed it. Oh, and we got the CGH, and it is not low. Uh, imagine that these are still attached to the vehicle and imagine that the vehicle is sitting on the ground. Uh, there's where the CGH is off the ground. Uh, for LCG stuff, we want to see the CG down around the beadlock ring or lower. And we are up at this highest lug right there. 3.87 inches. Uh, did I write that down in metric? No. Uh, it has a wheelbase of 309 millimeters. Okay, go figure. Uh, it is not particularly dynamic. The wheelbase doesn't change through suspension compression because the in the rear, the, the upper and lower length differential is like five millimeters. They're almost the exact same length. And then in the front, we've just got the wiggity, wiggity, wiggity wongus. Uh, front geometry. Now, I have been told, uh, I've heard tell, someone mentioned, uh, I, I got a whisper in my ear, that they had heard, and this is hearsay, we're going to find out right now, that they had heard that the shock has both the external spring and an internal spring. And upon hearing that, I said, that would honestly make a lot of sense. I just pulled a rear shock off and for like, that is so heavy. Uh, generally, when you take a shock off, you don't really feel the weight of it. Oh, yes. There is definitely a spring in there. Okay. So, when you have two springs in line with each other, and if you know this, good on you. And if you didn't, uh, join, join my crew. I didn't know this until about, I don't know, a couple months ago. When you see dual rate springs, and we will grab, man, that's springy. We will grab this little element. Uh, is this an element? Nope, this is something else. We'll grab another little baby spring like this. 
if you put two springs like this, where they're touching each other like this, if this is a two pound spring and this is a two pound spring, by butting them against each other like that to make a dual rate, it's effectively a one pound spring. So they can get away with using heavier rates because when you press on it, the one, you can feel it. Do it, try this at home. Take two springs, go like this, then put them against like this. And if you have something to hold the springs together, it helps even more. But when you go like this, you can feel how much softer it is because it halves the rates. It's a spring pressing on a spring. But if we have a spring on the outside and a spring on the inside, so those th that spring is obviously going to be smaller. The springs aren't touching each other is what I'm saying. So if this spring is rigidly mounted in there and this one is out here, then the rates are additive. So if you have a two pound spring and a two pound spring and you do it the way they've done it, you have a four pound spring now. So that is why it feels oversprung. Also, that's not what you want. If you have a, uh, uh, yeah, this shock is just built badly. Wow. I don't know if I've ever seen a, a bottom that, that big. Usually we're just going to use a plastic cup there. So let's leave that installed. Slide this. Uh, yeah. If you have one of these, uh, just uh, unless you plan on building a trailer at some point in the future, uh, just throw the wheels and tires away. Oh, yeah. Ugh. I should have gotten a second tool. I also should have gotten the... Uh, should have gotten the shock guy out because if you have the opportunity i've used this one for and there's some paint in there it doesn't matter if you have the opportunity to use your shock guy use your shock guy. bladder yep bladdered okay so we're not emulsion bladdered shocks now what we're gonna see is oh and hey Nut retention. I have no complaints about that. Uh, that means no eclipse. Please don't have an eclipse on the bottom. Please have a land and not an eclipse. Yeah, there's the internal spring. One or the other. You you can you can do. Well, these. We're not we're not outfitted for that. You can do one or the other. I don't. Oil is heavy. I'd say 40 plus over 40 weight. Yeah, that's that's real stiff. It's real tiny. I'd put it in the like two and a half, two and a half pound range. There's there's no need for that at all on this vehicle. All that spring is doing is everything you don't want it to do. It's mounted under the piston, which means it's pushing this up right? So it's pulling your ride height down, but it's limiting your down travel by eight millimeters or so. And it's just impacting droop negatively overall. Okay. We do have a land. We have no, we have no eclip on the inside. We have a two hole piston and I would like to, uh, I would like to take a side journey here. Oh, wait, no, before we go on our side journey, we have to do important stuff. That is a nine. Oh, we got a nice big bore. 9.5, uh, 9.535455. So call it 9.5 millimeters. And the inner bore of our shock is 9.8. That's, that's fairly industry standard. That's not, that's not grossly out of whack. We can also, springs are not quite ground techs 35 millimeters long 10 millimeter id so we do this low tech we set the caliper to around 10 millimeters a clo uh, ooh. close enough as to approximate 10 millimeters we get our scale we make sure it is in pounds we place the spring on the scale we zero it and we go one point eight 
closer to 1.9, so I will call it a 1.9. Where does that fall? In Enduro SE, white is 1.3, gray is 2.4, so we're right in between those. And in DravTech, I gotta peer my head around, in DravTech, a hard is 2.3 and a medium is 1.5. So we're right in between the two of those. Now, do I think that a 1.8, 1.9 is too stiff? Well, no, because we're now taking this guy out of the equation. We cannot collapse him uh, very far because he's very small. small. He is 15 millimeters long. And he collapses to six and a half millimeters. So nine eight two eight. We could almost collapse it and then multiply by three and find out what the rate is. Okay, we, we will try to we will try to we will try to guesstimate it. So if I set this to six point four ish. And I, I, if, if my math is right, we're talking linear. I'm going to call it 2.4, but that is to collapse it a third. So that would mean we need to collapse this spring an inch. I don't know. Uh, th th this math is out of my depth. Uh, I would think that it would translate linearly. So if this spring was long... To collapse at an inch would take almost seven pounds, but I might be wrong because we're only collapsing it this far. And it doesn't feel like seven pounds. No, you know what? Maybe it does <laughs> because if this is two, this definitely feels to be around six. Regardless of how many pounds that is, there's no reason for that spring to be in there. None. Uh... This thing was suffering from an absolute and utter lack of droop, and we're limited in that droop because we can't we can't collapse that spring down. There's no point in that being there. Now, this is what I had wanted to mention before I remembered I needed to caliper these things. I removed the rear spring by taking out two screws, an upper and a lower. And also, if you will note the the brace in here in the middle, it effectively renders the towers themselves almost superfluous. Like there's no real, just no real call for it. This, this is, well, why talk the talk? Let's, let's walk the walk. It's just braces bolted into braces, bolted into braces. And there's rigidity and then there's too much. Yeah. Okay. One could easily... So what they've done is it's belt and suspenders. If this plastic brace had a leg that went down to where that is, as a matter of fact, I don't, I don't even think it would matter. I don't think it would matter. Let's, let's do this. We will pull the tire, from, we will pull the shock from the other side. And then we will get to the thought, my incomplete thought, that I've tried to complete like a dozen times. Okay, this is... Whew, that was really in there. All right. If we have the shock mounted... I just want to see. Now, this one still has a spring in the inside, so I'm not going to... We're not, we're not going to crank it all the way down. We'll just, we'll just get it started. That's all that need. And then we go towerless, and we'll go to this one. Yeah, the uh, this is this is effectively superfluous, or opposite spectrum. This whole brace is superfluous. You could replace this. I now I myself personally would would rather leave these in place and just uh, replace this whole. Uh, stiffener with two lock nuts but this this tower is so it has it has two shock towers in the back well one shock tower two shock towers three four, it has four shock towers in the back 
Uh, in the front, we're, we're not going to have the same thing. But the front, the front is what we need to talk about. We need to talk about a lot. Because if you sit down and you look at this particular, this area right here, I'm going to need a pointer. I've been using this paintbrush. We're going to use this pointer. Kingpin. Drag link. Pan hard. Upper shock mount, lower shock mount. You will notice the placement of the screw that holds the pan hard on. I feel it would have been fairly simple. The, the, the pan hard mount is separate and it is removable. I feel it would have been fairly easy to engineer that pan hard mount the other way around so that the screw comes in from the back and goes towards the front. There is no room to put it in from the back to the front using a lock nut, so I don't know if the screw can be used front to back. We are going to try that one way or the other because you see that the pan hard screw dead ends right into the back of the shock. You could not fit a conventional shock here. You could only fit a shock. I mean, Desert Lizards would honestly be a better choice because you'd mount them shaft down and then you'd have some better clearance here. But if you want to remove that shock, you might look at it and you'd go, well, there's a C-hub right here. How is that lower shock mount attached? It is attached with a set screw. And the set screw uh, cannot be inserted from the inside. You would have no way to get to it because you have the truss here above the pumpkin. So the set screw, this is what you have to do. Say that I, for whatever reason, need to unbolt the axle side of my pan hard mount on my Red Cat Ascent. You have to get your wrench. We will make a little pile. I have to remove the screw holding the drag link and tie rod. I have to swing those out of the way. Now I have the C-hub loose. I now must remove the upper and lower kingpins. And the upper and lower kingpins are not shouldered. They use bushings. So we will remove those two, and when we go to remove this, nine times out of ten, the bushings will fall out. Oh, they are hats, so the upper will fall out. Okay, uh, points, plus points. Look at the size of that. Does it have a bearing? No. There's no bearing at the axle end. So we just have bearings in the portal box. We will take this apart momentarily and look at what it looks like inside, but that is... It's over six and a half. That is a six millimeter non-reduced axle. You're probably not going to break that. Back on topic. I now have to remove the shock, which means I need to get a 1.5 because the set screw comes right through here on the inside of the C-hub. So we take out this 20 millimeter set screw. We remove that, which will allow us to swing the shock out of the way, which will in turn give us access to the pan hard. And we can remove the pan hard screw. So, if you want to remove a shock, or if you want to disconnect your pan hard from the axle, lock nut. You effectively have to disassemble this entire front quarter to get to that. Now, you could indeed, I, I said that this is detachable. You could just detach this to get to the pan hard mount. Um, maybe, maybe. That is a side to side mount, not a vertical mount. So there's not gonna be a lot of lateral movement on the pan hard. I think you're still gonna have to disconnect the shock and take the front end off. The question is, could we replace? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, could you replace the chassis panhard mount with something that gives you a vertical mount like an element, which will give us a lot more panhard adjustments? Yes, because if we can get rid of Mr. Crooked Panhard, that will really help us a lot in eliminating the bump steer. We'll get to that. The, the C-Hub looks a little bit anemic. And don't forget, if you've forgotten, uh, don't forget, and if you never knew, now you'll know, the front axle is all one piece. The, the C-hubs are part of the axle. They are pretty thick, 
but we don't have any sort of gusseting, no, no strengthening. So that, that is, that is a snappable moment. We will, we will see. And then you would have the, just the uh, pure joy of taking apart the entire front axle. The hexes are not retained in any way. They're just, they're aluminum, but they're not screw pins. They are not set screwed. And when I pulled it, you heard the scatter scatter of the drive pin fly out. So I will find or replace that as needed. We now must see what do the portal gears look like. Now, I have never owned a Gen 8 nor a Gen 9, so I don't know what the portal gears are going to look like. Then what I will do is I will get the rest of the shocks off, and I will disassemble them, and I will clean them out, and I will refill them after having removed their tiny uh, unnecessary springs. Press the portal cover off. We've got a fairly beefy gear here. And yes, I mean, I, I can say, I can say just by looking, oh, ooh, ooh. Uh, yeah, there's, I don't see any call for a bearing that small on your inner, on your inner portal. So it also, the axle stub is reduced to fit in there. So, oh, and the axe, the, 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 the bearing in the outer is the same size. Um, eight. Four by eight by... Can I fit? Four by eight by three and a half. Not the first time I've seen that bearing. I'm not... I'm not a huge supporter of a bearing that tiny, particularly in this kind of application, because we have the top shaft supported by that, and we also have the inner shaft supported by that. Like, there's just a lot of unnecessary steps on this. We've got a step, and then we've got this size, and then we've got a step, and then we've got a step down again. Uh, the gears are centered for sure, and a little thin. Like, it, it's clear that they wanted to make efforts to make the portal box thinner, but at what cost? These are big mod one gears, and let me uh, let me do the math here. We've got an eight tooth upper and a seventeen tooth lower, which is two point one two five to one, two point one to one, which is a pretty big portal reduction. Not quite as big as Traxxas, but bigger than Elm, bigger than uh, Vanquish. In general, you've got 1.4, you've got 1.9 to 1. And you've got the 2.36 to 1 of Traxxas. This is 2.1 to 1, which is a, a, a fair, decent amount of reduction. And it needs to be, because we don't have any real reduction here. Because what we are going to need to do is... And uh, you, you may mention... Ah, oh, there it is. Perfect. Perfect. I was hoping the light would show it. Uh, in the first part of this, I mentioned that brass pinions are born to die. Brass pinions are born to die. They will begin to wear almost immediately. They can make it quieter, which I think they do successfully. Uh, and you see, you see the, what I call golding. You see the golding there? That is already pinion being embedded in the spur gear. Now, say for instance... Someone like myself, what he wants to do, maybe the, maybe the, the, we want to change our spur gear. The way this is oriented, I think we could successfully uh, tighten the slipper without having to take the front end apart. Because we could access it, it the nuts right there. I can get right down in there. So we could tighten the slipper. Let's say that the brass pinion has betrayed us and we need to change the spur gear because this is forward motor mount and not some sort of conventional three gear or even a conventional forward motor mount. Yeah, it didn't even occur to me that uh, 
These are unequal length drive shafts. Um, so the in looking at this, the universal has a set screw in it, and I don't know why. That set screw goes into this barrel, right? And I have mentioned universals get better the closer the what do you call that part? What is the part in between the yokes? What's that part? This part, the movie part, the closer it gets to being a ball, the better off you are. Because with this just being a straight up barrel, like the edges aren't even rounded off, when you get your steering angle, we can get to there, we can get to there, and there's where it notches. Click, clack, click, clack, click, clack. So you're giving up steering angle because the universal just won't turn that far. It's kind of a cost-saving measure. Across Amazon, you will find all the extremes. The newer Injora shafts that I've seen have just gone to a full ball. Like, there's more machining involved, so I think that's why many haven't gone to the full ball. So now we can take the shock out because we're going somewhere with this. I want to change my spur gear. Or alternately, I want to take the motor out. Because you will notice, should you take the uh, care to notice, the motor mount comes through the frame on both sides, meaning that the motor mount is obviously wider than the frame. Now, if the, and also the, the bolts, you can see the, the, not the head, but the butt, you can see the bolt butt there, countersunk holes on the inside of the rails. The screws come through and bolt through to the sides. So to remove these, to remove this plastic piece right here effectively, you effect, you, you basically have to disassemble the entire chassis. These have to be installed before the chassis is put together. So, to get that FMM out, same thing. You have to take an entire rail off to get that out. So instead, what we want to do is we just want to get, like, we want to change our spur or we want to get the motor out. So, first thing, you have to take both of your knuckles off to get to the shocks. So then we take both shocks off, and then we take these inexplicably oversized, Red Cat just does lo love using these, body mount slash braces, which we're not using the front one as a body mount, and this amount of stiffness, this is utterly superfluous, unless I guess you were going to run some form of body that doesn't use the, the clippy in the front. This is completely unnecessary. There's, there's, no, there's no flex to that at all. So much as this, either this or this is unnecessary in the rear, this, this is completely unnecessary in the front. This is a, uh, a, a rig here that we, we can save quite a lot of weight, honestly. So, uh, I mean, easiest, peasiest. The speed control should not be right here. If you were going to mount this speed control, mount it anywhere other than right there. Put it, put it right there. Because then that leaves this big opening here. And in that big opening, look what, look what fits in there. You just put your battery right there. Now, we do have an uncovered spur. So uh, you're probably not going to run it like that unless you want to uh, rip the balance wire off your lipos. So that's a problem. Now, we've gotten to there. And we now have access to one of the motor screws. The other motor screw is there and is completely inaccessible without removing the servo. So let's see how big we can get our pile of stuff before we can take the pinion gear off. Or take the motor out. Or change a spur gear. Some of that's out. We still have no access 
to the pinion gear. And by that, and by and no access to the pinion gear, I stand by that 100%. Say you just want to change your pinion gear. You want to remove the born to die brass. So we get it. We've loosened that. And now we're, we're hitting against the servo mount. So that's not coming out. So we then have to remove the shock tower. And, and for more fun, we, we can kind of get around it. So the shock tower has a screw into the brace and we remove here, 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 swing it around, remove the screws that hold the panhard mount in. Anybody counting? I've lost count. It's like 11. And now we can pull. It's still holding somehow. Oh, because I missed that one. The panhard mount has a screw that comes up from the bottom. There he is. So to get that brace out, you then have to take the panhard screw out. And now this comes out. So, okay, let me think. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I would say to get to the motor, it's at least twelve. Oh, I forgot about these too. Sixteen. 16 screws and most of the front end of the vehicle to be able to do that. Take the pinion gear off, which is a unmarked 12 tooth, uh, 12 tooth brass. Uh, we just make a mark and then we, we count them. Uh, it occurred to me, get the pen, start writing them down. 817 in the portal, 12 tooth pinion. I can't see it in the light. 56, 56 tooth. So that ratio is 4.66 to one repeating. 1256. 1256 is not uncommon at all. That's, that's a thing we've seen many times. And as I mentioned, with the way, why? 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 No. No. Don't. No. Stepped? Stepped screw pins? No. Uh, of all of the questionable and problematic things that we've seen so far, none more. None more. Uh, also, the drive shaft lengths are such that there doesn't appear to be a reason for this. Let's police. It doesn't appear that there's a reason for this upper shaft to be a slidey boy because this doesn't move and this doesn't move and it's fully collapsed. So the, we just need it for the CVD ends because the motor mount, in case you haven't noticed, the motor mount is at a wacky angle, about 15 degrees, and you can see why it's kicked. It's kicked so that the link doesn't hit it under compression. So that's, that's why the motor is angled, just for that. So we can't take this out. The only way to take that drive shaft out is to unbolt the T-case from the bottom. And the same applies to the rear drive shaft, which is fully collapsed and can move about two millimeters. So this thing is built like a puzzle box in that if you want to take any one part out, there are nine steps before you get to that. We have no choice 
but to remove the T-case because we have to know what gears are in it. And we also need to pull the front gear cover because we need to know what gears are in there. The drive shafts are fit together so, so tightly with so little uh, slack in them that I still have one drive shaft attached. And because the front drive shaft is still attached to the T-case, I can't take the T-case out. We'll pull our other stepped pin out, which means if you have other pins, forget it. Whatever you do, don't lose these. There they are. Okay, so now everything should be slacked out. I should be able to remove the T-case. Not easily. Okay. Transfer case is out. And I, I, I do take note of... I mean, what looks like hinges? Looks like a hinge to y'all, right? Let us take out this one. And loosen this one. Or is it just cammed in? It's just cammed in. It's not actually hinged. Are they the same length? Of course not. Of course not. Uh, this one is significantly longer than this one. They do the same job. Okay. Pull this cover off. And there are our, there are our plastic boys. And you can see they've left quite a lot of room around them. Uh, factory installed is 20, 24. We got to write that down. Not with that pen. Uh, T case stock 2024. And still here on our bench are our option gears. We've got 1926 and eight. I'm um, assuming it's supposed to be that. I'm guessing 1925 and 1826. We are, of course, going to go to the maximum. That lifts out pretty easily. Slide that out. It's nice to see that there's actually a little bit of grease in there. Not a lot. The gears appear to me to be nylon. Goes like that. Let's see if I guessed right. Yes. So, so 18, 1826. So, it comes from the factory, if we, if we can indeed call it that. We've got a sh... Nope, no shims. Just, we just have bearing seats that aren't as deep as the bearing themselves. They're about a, a millimeter less deep. So we clank that together, and that should give us... Well, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do the math. So the stock T-case... Is 20 upper, 24 lower. We leave the 2024 in the front. That's the way it's supposed to be. We replace the rear with 1826, which leaves the front ratio at 1.2 to 1 and the rear ratio at 1.4444444, infinitely repeating. If you divide 1.4444 into 1.2, you get 0.8333333, infinitely repeating which means that our underdrive ratio to the rear is close enough as to be 17%. It is actually 16.66666 off into infinity with a 7 on the end. When you reach infinity, erase a 6 and put on a 7. So we've got 16%. I think that's fine. So the only number that we have not arrived on, the only number we don't know yet, is what is our... Uh, Ring and pinion. And when we get our ring and pinion, then we will know the no. And we'll know what the FDR is in this vehicle. Because so far, we are at 1.2 times 4.66. We're at 5.6 to 1. So all we have left to do is multiply... I already forgot it. 5.59. We need to multiply 5.6 to 1 
by this ratio, and then we need to multiply that number by 2.1. My guess is, what, 830? Is it 830? Although, we don't know with these guys because, oh my god, the weight of that. Uh, if you're wondering where this thing is picking up the girthy bulks and the bulky girths, it's that some of the parts... That stepped pin is so hard to get out of there. Uh, some of these parts, they just ain't care. I need a, I need a pusher. I need a pusher. Ah, yes. I'm familiar with that. Okay. All right. So the shaft is keyed to the pinion. And that is indeed what you think it is. That is a screw holding that on. So it's in two pieces. And this, if you want to know why the pumpkins are so big, we need a banana for scale. And here I provide you with bananas, as it were. Here is your, your pinion gear from your Red Cat Ascent. And here is the pinion gear out of an element. And while we're at it, here is the absolute monster out of a red cat ascent. And here is the, here's the carrier out of an element enduro axle. And the, the, there, there's your, there's your pumpkin. I mean, if you want to know why the pumpkin is so big, it's right there. So we gain the strength of, yes, the gear teeth are bigger. Uh, it doesn't, but because this has a stepped that like in a perfect world, there's no step there because we have to go through a bearing that is particularly thin wall in there. And I think that bearing will have the same weakness that a lot of other uh, pinion carrier bearings, inner pinion carrier bearings have. Our outer bearing is just a regular old five by 11. Just, uh, I, ha I had to satisfy my own curiosity. This weighs 31 grams, so over an ounce, and uh, this weighs 18, so just, just for that. Uh, perhaps, potentially, just to be contrarian, uh, this has 32 teeth, whereas 30 is kind of just like the established standard. And this has 11, so we do 11 into 32, we get 2.9. So, we take our spurt opinion, 4.66. We multiply that by the ratio in the T-case of 1.2, which gives us that 5.59. We multiply that by the ring and pinion ratio, which is 2.9, which gives us 16.22. And we multiply that by the 2 point, I wrote it down, the 2.1-ish, we'll call it 2.1, that's in the portals, which gives us a final drive to ignore the scribbles, uh, 34, 34 to one. You can't even read that. F D R. And when I saw this on the internet for the first time and I looked at it and I gave it a cursory glance and I saw that it was outfitted with a 42 turn 550 motor, I said, that thing has probably got a final drive ratio of around 35 to one. I would be wildly surprised if it was more than 35 to 1 and it is not it is 34 to 1 so your your uh, the, the availability of motor choices to you is slim because 34 to 1 is no no reduction it's no reduction i can already tell you that the bolt pattern should be fairly standard where the T case is. I don't think you would take any substantial performance hit by replacing this skid with something conventional, putting a three gear in there, putting a motor in it, and just running it like that. Because it would allow you access to the motor, to the spur gear, to the pinion gear, to everything, and would give you more gear reduction. So, we're making... We are sacrificing much for... What I would honestly just classify as no reason. Now, what we need to find out is... So, the hex 
for the slipper is okay for a second I thought they were just flat washers but they are indeed concave to give us some slipper action okay we have a flat so the shaft is flatted so there will be no pin in the backside it's just all flatted I don't know how much advantage this slipper is going to provide particularly with how obnoxious it is to get off because the question here is always what are our spurtier choices so can we the shaft is fairly short and it's not as if we could throw on anything like a belt drive which would give us less gear reduction if we were going anywhere we would want more gear reduction and here oh my goodness oh my goodness did you did you see that sweet little infant baby look at it so it is effectively as short as this can be like using the ends that they use there there's the screw right there so that's that's as short as this drive shaft can physically be made. Uh, I've seen others that their approach to the, and then uh, I will give them this. Uh, this could easily be remanufactured. You could easily remake this and use whatever you want up here on the top. Ooh, that's a that's a hey. I'm glad you asked. That's a good question. Which is, did they go super proprietary and super short, or can we do something like? fit an element on there yeah it's not super tight there's a little wiggle but if i were to take off the little flange there top and bottom just sand those off because the square goes all the way through yes you could indeed put a proper spur gear on here and switching this to 48 pitch uh, would allow us to get like, I can put a 12-tooth 48-pitch on here in place of the 32-pitch. And put, like, an 87 on here because... In the, in the fineries of the universe, an 87 and a 56 are almost the exact same size. The 87 is maybe a millimeter bigger. So 1256 is, what did I say, 466 to 1? 1287. I'm not even going to try to do it is 7.25 to 1. So you'd, you'd be getting this thing up around 50 to 1 in the final, which would allow you to run a proper motor. And we want to run a proper motor, don't we? We don't, what we don't want to do is run this motor, which is still, nope, okay. To get the motor out is actually, Four more screws, because due to the angle of the motor mount, the motor mount is directly in line with the front bumper mount. I was going to say, and I'm still, I'm not ruling it out, but I was saying, uh, I was saying in my head, we should take this thing apart to the point where we can get one chassis rail off. <laughs> It's not bolted in, my friends. That's the magnet. <laughs> Y'all ever had that happen? What? No? No? That's not a thing? Uh, you've never had your m motor uh, glue itself to the... Uh, oh. Don't, don't, drop, don't drop your 42 turn 550. It will pick up all the screws. So I am still contemplating. I'm looking down the side of the chassis now. Yeah, okay. I'm not going to make you watch it. We're going to cut, but we're going to weigh a rail. I would like to point out that that is not, that is not easy to get out. And, uh, yeah, it's heavy. It's real heavy. You can get to the motor mount by motor mount. Does it, does it feel aluminum? I think it feels aluminum. Oh, we can check with the motor. Yeah, good. We're alloy there. So the steel is only in the rails. 
I need to get my specific uh, rail weighing piece of wood out. We'll put the scale up here. Go here. It's in grams. Do I do I have to unbolt the tower for us to get the the number? Oh no, I don't. Okay. To get just rail weight, we can subtract fourteen plus. What do you want to call it? Seventeen. We'll say seventeen grams. So we'll do this minus seventeen. That singular chassis rail is 134 grams, including the tower and the bracket for the FMM. So we'll call that 117. That's a, it's close enough as to be five ounces. Like, like why? Like why? You got... You made all of these pieces out of aluminum, and they're not remarkably lightweight. It's half an ounce. Half an ounce for a shock tower. Half an ounce. Um, if we want to talk about things in terms of competition, a plastic shock tower would weigh five or six grams. Uh, an alloy version of this rail would weigh... Here's a chassis rail of uh, somewhat in-house design that is not currently in use. It weighs 1.9 ounces. That's 53 grams. And has shock, front shock tower built into it. So it's basically equivalent to weighing as this at 133 grams. I think we got 134 before. There we go, 134 grams. And it comes in pairs. So ignoring the shock tower, which we can't, the shock is included. Let's just call it what it is, 134. That's 268 grams for the two chassis rails. Uh, and these two chassis rails would weigh 100. 170 grams is 6.5 ounces. Uh, we can also take off the weight of that, which we don't need. And the other one, which we don't need. I mean, we're, we're definitely in a place where it's easy to lose weight. Because we can easily shed. Well, and also, we, we can run it with just the cab. Or can we? Because you will notice, the front and rear sections of the cab are held together with six fasteners. That, that bolt right here. Uh, eyes bolts. The chassis rails, which I'm just going to unplug the plugs so that we can have uh, free reign here. I do, I, I kind of like these sliders with the, with the integrated battery strap. It's not too bad. These are the massive, look like 40s through bolts that bolt the lower suspension links on. And you'll notice right here, We'll see these little standoffs with those with those little dudes, right? We we recognize the standoffs with the dudes. Best as I can tell, little standoffs in the dudes, they go they go right like that. So unless there's some special magic, I'm gonna find the book. Unless there's some special magic in the book. You screw the body on? So if you're running cab only, you you have to insert four screws in into the into the body. You these four screws you screw the body onto the chassis. So after digging out the uh mm, not manual, yes, 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 yes. Quick start guide, which is that like here's what makes it move doesn't even like tell you what stuff is uh, it does direct you on the back to uh you can go you can go over here to red cat and you can look up the manual which uh doesn't tell you very much it does have some exploded views down here at the bottom some little exploded views 
and it does indeed tell us that the speed control is a 1040, not a 1060, it's an HX1040. So that's going to be a big part of the problem, being a 1040. It makes no mention whatsoever of running the body as a cab only. When we can see, like, I mean, it's pretty obvious, but I, I guess you have to you have to screw the thing together. So if you want to run cab only on this, you have to screw the cab to the vehicle. Which, I mean, you know, some of the hard bodies on our super wheel drives are like that, where you got to take out four screws. We just replaced those with set screws, so I'm wondering, we're going to, oh, we, oh, we're going to find out. Is it possible to just drive some long set screws in there and just, like, push the body over it? If so, that would be great. It's... I mean, so, we're done with this. Yes? Yes. We're done with this. We're done with this. The, the standout, the inarguable standout of this whole vehicle is the Hexfly Torque Spec HXTS. This, this, so far, oh, the rod ends are so tight. Uh, the HXTS is the uh, head and shoulders above the rest standout of the entire Red Cat Ascent uh, dive into madness. Like, that, that's, that Sura is pretty good. It's not just pretty good. It might be the best RTR servo that I've tested yet. Like it, it doesn't just do the job or work. I don't see any reason to replace it. It's, it's pretty much that good. So we are just going to find it. It's here on the bench. What I've got to do, we'll pan out here for you. What I've got to do is unring what I have wrought. I just, uh, we just started pulling it apart. I do indeed have to disassemble all of the shocks and reassemble them because they have an extra, like, there's your, there's your total suspension travel. So it's not even one of those instances where I would say, oh, well, you can just pop the external spring off and just, just run them like this. I, I don't think I don't think you could, because that's still seventeen millimeters total, maybe, if if even close to that. So, you know, for for frame of reference. So yeah, uh, right about right about there, about the same, right? Uh, yep, that, that's full out. We're talking, you know, it's triangles. Double, double the suspension travel on these desert lizards versus those. Now, unfortunately, these desert lizards are built to be run this way. They're built to be run upside down. So I would have to disassemble these and completely rebuild them because there's no way this is going to fit. It's, it's a calamity here is what it is. There's stuff falling everywhere. Uh, uh, oh, I don't know. Maybe it will. We can't really lean it, though. Oh, before I go. Before I go and put this back together. You'll see me again. Before I go and put this back together. Let's see if this screw can go in the other way. Oh, no problem. Yeah. So that's one, that's one problem solved. So now we can, uh, we can uh, uh, replace or adjust the panhard bar as necessary without... Uh, without taking the whole friend and the vehicle off part. Now, what none of this can address, what we cannot address is if we are sticking with the FMM as is, which we are going to for the for for, for now. We're going to put the motor in here and you see have you ever seen have you ever seen a, a an upper link that attaches literally dead center in the middle of the axle? So there is no triangulation to that link. The link has a standoff end to keep it off the chest. This isn't even like, oh, okay. They didn't even trash can engineer that. Like it's not, 
it's not right. You see how it hangs at an angle like that? It should hang like that, but that link is going to pull because the disparity in length between the lower and the upper, like nobody, nobody did the math. No, nobody did math. So we have put in the big underdrive, as it were. We are going to assemble this in the way that we want to assemble it. Uh, 1080. No, 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 no. Fusion 1200. I am not going to mess with it. We're going to put the spur and the pinion back in there, despite the fact that I will have to disassemble it again to get to that spur and pinion again. We're going to put the shocks together in a way that I think makes sense. I'm going to re-grease all of the... This stuff had a little, I mean, it had some grease. Just, I mean, that's clean. Not a lot of grease in there. We'll Regrease it, get it all assembled. It's going to be a minute. It'll take me a minute to get this put back together. I will get it put back together. And then I would be, I would be a big jerk face if we didn't at least just take it out and drive it a little. We will put it on the uh, wheel tire combo that it will be doing its competition but we got to get a little bit of wheeling. We got to see is it going to get better if we just replace minimal stuff. So all that's going to be replaced today is wheels, tires, and the motor, the, the drivetrain, right? The the motor. So speed control and motor. We'll do that. We're going to build it. I'm going to well, I'm going to put it back together. And I just saw the open portal box over there and everything. We kind of, uh, we kind of Kool-Aid man this. We just kind of, oh yeah, we just burst through the wall and just took everything out with us. So I am going to uh, do my very best to put the screws back in the locations that they are supposed to. I'm going to reassemble this. I'm going to grease it. I'm going to reassemble it. I am going to omit some of the parts that I think are ripe for omission. And then we are going to see. So this is phase one. And when I get it put together, I'm going to weigh it. And I will give you those numbers as well. And then in the next episode, there'll be a lot less faffing. Hopefully no disassembly. And in part three of the quick view, the ascent will go directly head to head against the Enduro SE as they are about, they should be right around the same dollars of expenditure. So... Let me get this reboot together. Uh, uh, you're going to click pause, uh, get yourself a beverage or something, and because you'll be back in one second, and I'll be back, God knows, at some time in my future. All right, everybody. I, I haven't given up. Uh, I have cleaned up. And a, an amount of time has passed, an amount of time that is not insignificant, because bef before we go any further, uh, let me complain about... The shocks, okay? In my hands right here, you can, you can see it if we get it in frame. That is a bladder from a Traxxas GTS. Uh, not, a, not a GTS, from a Traxxas, a big bore, 2660, also featured in Dravtex. Excellent bladder for bladdered shocks. This, and we will leave them there for side by side comparison. This is the bladder that comes in a Red Cat shock. Why is this a problem? Well, the, the inner bore of a big bore is about the same as the inner bore of a of these, whatever Red Cat is calling these. So the bladder is really, really oversized. Now what happens with a bladder that oversized is that if you are indeed successful in getting the bladder in, and the shock still leaks uh, quite a good bit, like I made an enormous mess trying to fill these. The bladder is so big that the bladder basically acts like a spring. So when these had an external spring and an internal spring and the bladder, it was as if they had three springs. Because the oil can push the... It'll usually extend out to about there. So I would say that if you were to fill these properly, the only way you could get them to function somewhat correctly would be to just run them with no springs at all and just use the bladders as basically low suspension. But... No matter what you do, the length of the body is far too long for the length of the shaft because of how big the cartridge area is down at the bottom. 
So there's really no point in tuning on these shocks because A, they're a pain directly in your ass, and B, we know what we have to go through to get to the shock. To take your front shocks off, you have to disassemble the front end of the truck. To get the pinion off, you have to disassemble the front end of the truck. So maintenance is not this thing's friend. And the front end geometry, even as it's sitting now, the front end geometry is far below suboptimal. So I intended to go in like stages where we'll do this and do this and do this. It's so difficult to work on. It included so many superfluous parts that I just took off everything I didn't need. I didn't absolutely need. Because we don't need the battery tray. I, we don't have the... The back half of the body weighs more than a J-Concepts Creep. Just this part weighs more than a Creep cab. Uh, omitted this. I don't like the looks of the shock towers. I don't like the geometry of the rear shocks. There's a lot I don't like. What I do like is it's pretty quiet. Look, look how nose high it sits. And you can see, maybe it needs 80s in the front. This thing will not get low enough. It, the way it is built as the shocks attach to the tops of the axles, there's no real way to lower it. You can't get it lower. Now, what we do have is we have free traveling suspension now. So it will actually flex like a normal vehicle. We can't, with these towers, we cannot get it to sit, oh, and important, let's not bury important things. Put four set screws into those posts. You pull back a little. They hang nicely on the threads. So you kind of finagle it off, body comes right off. So that's pretty nice, points there. As you see, I omitted everything in the back, just as this, and I would prefer to just replace that with just a, a metal standoff. There's no need for anything else. It's steel. Each half weighs, what did we figure, five ounces? So there's no, there's no, all those, all those braces are utterly superfluous. So we took off a fair decent amount of weight. Uh, we are on RC4GS. And yes, there is supposed to be a 1200 KV in there and not a Hobby Park 55 turn. Why is there a Hobby Park 55 turn in there? Because I took that 1200 out of the brushless box. I have a box down there that just says brushless motors on it. I took it out and I set it on the bench. And I can't find it. I looked for it for like 15 minutes. I, I don't know where it is. I found the 1800. I can't find the 1200. So I figured with a 34 to 1 gear reduction, 55 turn should be about right. And I think it is. The... Top speed might be a little low. I just left the same gearing. I didn't bother to mess with the gearing because I figured if I'm going to have to take it apart to get to the gearing anyway, like I can change the motor to later date. So we've got a 1080 on here. I just went with the sides because honestly, to put a battery up here, you can get like a 650 or an 850 up there, but you're not fitting a 1500. Not, not under the tuck at the front of the body, not without getting something much too close to uh, very exposed gears. So, uh, Desert Lizards are a radical improvement over the included shocks. The electronics are a radical improvement. As I said, the only thing that I wouldn't immediately replace is the servo. Servo seems good. Now, we can, real quick-like, real quick-like, we can go over, I did scale it again. So we were 5.75 pounds, 2,608 grams, of which 480 grams was the wheel tire combos. We are now sitting at 2,726 grams, that is 6.01 pounds, it's actually 6.008, so we're just, we're right on 6 pounds, RTR with the body installed, and the wheel tire combos uh, are 805 grams. I would like to actually see a little more weight, maybe brass uh, SLWs, because this thing at 1,000 uh, kilo wheelos, I think would be about right. We're sitting at 805, which brings our unsprung in, in term of combo weight. Obviously, the axles are unsprung as well. But just talking about unsprung that we can work with, 
uh, we're moving from 18% of total vehicle weight to 29%. So I think that's going to be the biggest individual uh, component change. And then what I did not do, we are now 58%, we are 58.42 distribution, which is a whopping percent, 1% change. We were 57.43, and that's with omitting everything back here. There's nothing back there except towers that I don't like. I would like to see the shock lower. I want to see this sitting here, about there. We can't really go much lower because something, uh, the chassis side panhard mount bottoms out into the axle. Now we're, we're almost okay on flex. We cannot compress all the way because we are, uh, we are physically limited from doing so, but we've got 17% overdrive. We've added 10% more to the unsprung weight. We've chopped a bunch of weight out of the back. The shocks should work better. The motor should work better. The speed controller should obviously work better. Everything should work better. So let's go out and we'll do a quick mash about, mash about, mash about. And I think, honestly, I think the plan is I'm just going to rebuild the chassis. Uh, I will go, I will copy some of the holes down here and then I will just go to a new, I will just make an aluminum plate chassis without these inarguably hideous shock towers look mm -hmm. look at that shock tower it's awful mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. let's get it put together mm -hmm. let's get it out on the rocks mm -hmm. and now uh, let's see if it's it can't be worse right a couple of notes uh, i i i've never i've never driven anything that felt this zazzy on a 55 but I don't think I've also ever driven anything not that's like a rift or something that only had 34 to one final drive. Uh, the body uh, mounted this way is bonky. Uh, it is a bonky McClatter trap and the, the throttle tip in is much better. Obviously it's a 1080, but the minimum wheel speed I feel like I could still do a little better. I honestly, I have to get to a wheel speed point. Yeah, we're, we're in there. We're, we're in it. We are in it. We are at a point where the geometry of the vehicle and the shocks are built as light as I could build them. 300 CST in there in the three hole, four, four hole in the widest open pistons to try to quicken them up a little bit. But in terms of for, Oh, how's the 55? Well, I, I think it, it needs a fusion or a 550 because we have no mechanical advantage. So that 55 should hold this thing no problem. All I can really think about is that the, the trigger feel is so much better. It's so, so, so much better. It's kind of ridiculous. The tires are indeed acting a little firm. Oh, that was, that was nice. Okay. Okay. Almost enough turn in there. Yeah, the, the, and I, I, I have the endpoints set, uh, right, right on, right on. And it's quite a bit down. It, it makes me feel like this is a 270 throw servo or something with a lot of throw, or it could just be the horn, the way the horn is laid out but I think it's like 66% each direction, which is good and bad, you know. Optimally, you want the servo to be 100-100 because then you're using all of the available throw, all of the available torque. This does allow you to act a little quicker. Yeah, the drag, the drag rig is just bad. And it has, as far as I'm concerned, 
nothing to do with the economy 55 turn that's in there. It, it's trying its very best. I mean, we are improved. We are certainly improved. Uh, I have to say, the 1040 plus that 42 turn 550, there, there, was, there was more drag break. There's less drag break now, but yeah, we went from a 550 to a 540. There's going to be less drag break. I don't want to put some cheap so in here. I wanted to put a Fusion 1200 in here and I can't find it. It is, I have never, uh, I have said this and I will reiterate. I have never felt a motor of this high of turn roll out this fast. Like, okay, here we are on the rock and watch, we'll go. What just happened? Oh man, is it cut off? It's cut off. I had a... I had a one in three chance on the bench. One in three chance. So two notes, I don't know how shadow charred this uh, ascent is going to be right here. I just wanted to give it a quick shot on the staircase. And the whole drive back, all I could do was look at that idiotic rear shock mounting position. It is idiotic. I, like why? I can't get enough. Maybe, maybe I can. I did indeed move the rear uppers to the higher position. One position. I mean, there's, there's two of two options. I feel like it's, I feel like it's close. There he is. There it is. Yeah. Would not have had. <laughs> what are we what are we doing and that that question is not rhetorical I'll, I'll tell you what i think we're doing and it it's some flavor of self-loathing do i think that you can make this thing quasi-competent I kind of do. And for quasi, the, the qualifier for quasi competency is we retain the T case, the FMM, and the axles. And I mean, other than that, and obviously, why, why, why wouldn't we include the body? I mean, now it's a cab. It's a cab. So what we're going to have to do is figure out how to fix that front end. And I've got some ideas. So we might be slipping into four parts here because uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's break it down. You've all seen him. If you've been here before, you have seen Baseline, the well-worn and well-traveled Enduro SE that is on stock C channels, stock almost everything, right? He's had some running gear parts replaced because he puts in more miles and more hours than anyone else. He runs the exact same wheel tire and insert combo as is fitted to this right now. And if we were to go head to head in a versus Street Fighter style competition, if we were to go head to head right now, and he's not, it, well, this isn't one of those, ba -ba, He's not gonna fly in out of frame. If Baseline came and they went toe to toe on any selection of obstacles, um, this Red Cat vehicle would, would get beaten so soundly. Stop! He's already dead. In order to improve the overall handling of this vehicle, we must make substantive changes which involve lessening the weight 
this thing would actually drive pretty okay for a trail rig. But nothing about its performance behavior says LCG or competitive to me at all. As I have been at this for liter literally hours today, uh, we are into the evening. No, time change. We are into the afternoon. And if this vehicle had come out of the box at this level of performance, just this minimum level of performance, I would consider that, I'd be like, oh, oh, we've got something we can work with. What I had to do to get this to where it is, it's not exceptional. We haven't, we don't roll, we don't roll all the way now because we've 10% more unsprung weight. It just, what we've done, changing the shocks helped, changing the wheels and tires helped, changing the electric. All of the changes that have been made have been productive, but now we get down to it. We're down to the real stuff. There's not nearly enough triangulation in the rear. There's no triangulation in the front. The front shock positioning and angles are poor. They don't allow front end compression. The pan hard mount is poor. It does not allow for front end compression. The only thing we've kind of gotten is that, no, we don't, no, we don't, we don't, we don't have anything. We don't have anything in the front. We have more travel now, but the travel is uneven. So I didn't even bother to compute cross weights. It would have shown up on the sheet. The guy inside would have taken care of those computations. But the cross weight has to be all over the place because due to the panhard length and the panhard attachment points, there's a reason that they limited the suspension droop as much as they did. And let's see, let's see if we can get over here without rolling. And uh, I will show you. That was almost, that was almost composed right there. Look at, look at you little guy. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I can hold this. And if I let go of the drive shaft, you will see we have quite a bit more droop on the non panhard side. And that's because when we get to here, the panhard will just pull the shock back up. Because there's no triangulation in the front. That was the one thing that I was gonna say they got pretty close, is that the panhard angle and the drag link angle are roughly parallel, but parallel at what cost? At a cost that I well and truly believe no one did any math. It sits impossibly high. It looks cartoonishly high. And then when you catch a glimpse of it from the side, the shock has five or six millimeters of shaft showing, meaning we're almost, we're as close to all the way down as we can because I'm running the medium length uh, inner spring in an effort to bring the to bring the ride height down as much as possible. That motion right there, what you're seeing, that, that tendency to do that, is a combination of both rear link angle, because there's no mechanism to get an amount of satisfactory anti-squat from the rear link angles. And it's also brought to us by the lack of triangulation in the front, because that center mounted, you can't mount your front upper link dead center because it's going to act like a pivot and that's what it does it's pivoting the axle around it and i think what they did is they did that and then they saw it and then they were like oh well just mechanically limit excuse pardon moi france francais limit the living shit out of it so that we don't have to correct our own mistakes this, what we have here, what is before you, peg-legging to the sky, is indefensible. 
Anyone who tells you that you should go out and buy one of these, is, and I'm talking to each of you individually and specifically, this isn't about how I feel about Red Cat. I could go into this absolutely blind, not knowing who made it. If someone does this to geometry and then, and then puts it out, apparently it went through no level of peer review of any kind, and then they release it into the world and they send it out to people and the people receive it. And I have made a point to have watched no Red Cat Ascent content prior to now, save for one video, and it had no wheeling content in it. It was just like basically an unboxing. If someone tells you that this vehicle is a viable option, that this vehicle is a place that you should spend your money, it goes beyond them doing a disservice to you. They are lying to you. That front end might be correctable with the FMM as it sits. Might. And that's a, that's a big in parentheses with quotes around it. Might. I might be able to correct this by basically reconfiguring the entire front end. And I haven't looked at it closely enough to see if I even can. But I think I can. I think I can. And we are going to, we are going to pursue that. Now, if I get to a point where we'll just, we'll just let it go. If I get to a point where I have to put new frame rails on this thing, is it still a red cat ascent? Like it'll have the FMM and the axles, but then what was the point of the flat plate chassis in the first place? because I'm over here just waiting for it. I'm waiting for something good to happen. It doesn't behave like it has the clearance of portals. And I came to the conclusion as to why, uh, if you can look right there, and I think we can track in enough, if you were to draw an imaginary line that extends from the bottom of the portal box to the bottom of the pumpkin, it's a straight line. So we have portals that only just make up for the lack of ground clearance borrowed about by the gigantic pumpkins. So it behaves clearance wise like a straight axle, but with the drawbacks and none of the benefits of a portal. The benefit of a portal is increased ground clearance doesn't behave like it has increased ground clearance. A portal will also give you increased gear reduction. They are relying on the portal to get gear reduction, period. We would have double, if we change nothing else, except we take out the FMM, we put in a gearbox, attach the motor with a 12 tooth pinion and a 56 tooth spur, we omit the transfer case and put in a three gear, we will more than double the gear reduction. We will go from 35 to one to around between 70 and 80 to one, which is an, a mountain of mechanical advantage. So I see a reason to move forward. We don't, we don't know when to quit, but my God, the, I don't know. I don't know. It's going to go head to head against baseline. We're going to have to decide how far are we going to go before it goes against baseline? Because honestly, to be fair, it would have to go now. It would have to go against him now. And I think that's potentially a foregone conclusion. So here's what we'll do. We're going to put a couple days of daylight between this debacle and the next. And I am going to do what I have done often. And that is put it to you. The it being this. Have I done anything 
to the ascent here that you would consider a disservice? Have I harmed its capabilities in any way? Or do you think it has been as improved as we can without, without going to some measure of extreme? Uh, I, I would put a three gear in it. But if we put a three gear in it, it is arguably no longer an ascent. So for the third installment of this, and there's, so there's going to be a third and a fourth, but the third, I, I need you to help me out. Do I do more or do we rock it like this? Ascent versus Enduro SE, 299 versus 299. A Fusion, I think, would give us a little bit more drag break. But this combo, like that, that's how much rollback we get. Uh, this combo is not bad. The combo feels good. It, it feels fine. It just, with a 55 turn, 55 turn 540, not quite enough torque to hold this with no mechanical advantage. And honestly, still a little bit too much wheel speed. It needs like a 65 or more or potentially dropping to like a nine tooth pinion. But here's the thing, you have to take the entire front end apart. So then you're just like, well, let, why just go in and change the pinion? Let's change a bunch of other stuff. Like I could get much more gear reduction in the front. I could get up to like a seven to one gear reduction, spur and pinion down from the 4.25. Might help slow it down a little, which a little bit more mechanical advantage. I need some ideas in the comments what more do we do to go against baseline? Or are, are you of the mindset of just, just do it. Just, just put him, throw him in the deep end and see if he can swim. I think the most apt description that I've come up with so far is all the drawbacks of a portal with none of the benefits. It rides silly high. And I don't just mean that in terms of like ground clearance. I mean that when this thing snaps out and bites you, uh, like I can feel the roll coming many times right there, starting to get a little light. But then there are also times when it will just load, load. And I know the only thing stopping that from doing it triple back flip let's is that the motor doesn't have enough is not providing enough torque so i don't i don't know i am way too close to the problem here so i'm gonna have to rely on you all uh episode three has got to be this thing versus baseline how much further do we go it can show me glimmers Oh, also the, uh, with the mechanical limiters that are built into the knuckles, uh, the, the, the turning circle is pretty bad. It's pretty bad. And I think they do that as a safety limiter for the universals. So the proverbial ball is in your collectively proverbial collective court. not shown in the edit. I just tried to self-write that thing for about 40 seconds solid and, and couldn't get it over. Because uh, despite increasing the, maybe it was the increase of track width, we're, we're about 10 millimeters wider on this rim than the plastic wheel. Uh, I just, I can't get it back onto its wheels. And it has honestly uh, sucked out of me any motivation to get up and try to flip it over. Uh, after I spent about 40 seconds trying to self-write it and it turtled itself. I'd say it was all of the drawbacks of a portal, none of the benefits. I would say it was a good four or five seconds where I just sat and stared at it blankly and thought, do I even want to get up and flip it over? I think... I think I might be able to fix the front. 
There we go. There we go. Get rid of that. Okay. So if you don't, <laughs> if you don't use screws to hold the body on, uh, you can indeed just knock the body off. I, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I mean, how can people defend this? How is this even considered an option? I lack the mental fortitude to go on YouTube and watch other videos to see what other channels have said about this because as my buddy's dad said to him when he got caught shoplifting uh, football cards from a Long's Drugs on Christmas Eve, he looked at him and he said, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. Red Cat. I'm not mad, just disappointed.